Stephanie. And this is Brian. Welcome to our podcast, The Making and the Remaking of a Codependent Mind. We're at season three, episode two at this point, where we're in our the season where we talk about specific topics. Today, we're, we would like to talk about this idea of diagnoses. And we chose this because the idea of getting a diagnosis or being diagnosed can be somewhat problematic and fraught. Right. For instance, codependency is not an official diagnosis. Right. Like we talked about in, in the in the probably the first episode of the first season, where it's just actually not recognized as as an official behavior disorder. So therefore, there's no way to get an official diagnosis of codependency. Official being diagnoses that are governed by the DSM. The DSM stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Mm-hmm. And it's the reference book for people in the mental health industry. It lists all of what are recognized mental disorders or psychological disorders. And codependency is not included in that manual. Mm. But we have found the idea of codependency so helpful and in terms of your healing. Yeah. So what does it mean that it's not an official diagnosis? And I guess kind of what is a diagnosis anyway? Yeah, exactly. Right. So that would be a good place to start this discussion, I think, is just to what exactly is this and why does people take it so seriously or find it so valuable or not? Mm-hmm. In the case of codependency, we were saying, since it's actually not a diagnosis, it's still a very helpful term. And it was infinitely helpful for me and for us to understand what was going on with me. So the word diagnosis is used outside the medical field. Right. Like getting a car fixed or something like here, here's the diagnostic of what's wrong with your car. Exactly. Or, you know. Right. The, a, a mechanic will diagnose a car or, uh, and there are other examples when it's used in that way. It's, it's about determining what is wrong, mm-hmm. finding out what is wrong. Yeah. And then so similarly within the medical field or, or health, it's identifying a disease or condition using it the symptoms of those diseases and conditions. Right. And then there's a body of knowledge about what this identif- this thing that was identified means. Mm-hmm. Um, it may have, people have different opinions about that, what specifically you may mean once you finally actually diagnose something. Get a diagnosis. Or what to do with right. that information. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, it's ideally it's something that can be acted on. When either a car mechanic makes a diagnosis, a doctor makes a diagnosis. Yeah. Ideally, then there's a course of action that can be taken in response to that. Yeah. So, so kind of fundamentally, I would take diagnosis to mean figuring out what is happening. Yeah, right. There seems to be a problem here. What is the problem? <laughs> yeah, what is the problem? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I have an experience with being diagnosed, not in the mental health arena, but in the physical health arena. When I was young, my knee swelled up quite a bit, and I got a diagnosis of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It looked very much like JRA. That's a shorthand for, for juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and, you know, they did some tests. There's no absolute test mm-hmm. for JRA. So it, it's supposed to be a diagnosis of elimination, meaning you eliminate all, all the other okay. diseases or conditions that you know can cause a swollen, fluid-filled knee, and then you're left with with JRA. So I was I was diagnosed with JRA, and that diagno- I was treated under that diagnosis for about five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I took an aspirin every day. I did you know the other things that they do for arthritis. But at that point, I saw a specialist, and I had I had a surgery where they inserted a camera into my knee and took a look around. Uh-huh. And at that point, I was re-diagnosed. I was undiagnosed from me having arthritis, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I was diagnosed as having another condition. Um, the condition is called pigmented villanodular synovitis. It's very rare, and if you know some Latin, I don't know some Latin, but if you know some Latin, you can probably tell that the, the name of that condition, pigmented, is colored villanodular or small bumps mm-hmm. synovitis on the synovium, which is the lining of the, of the knee. So literally, it was just... The name of the condition is just a description of what they see on the knee, which is bumps on the lining of the knee. Yeah. Colored bumps on the lining of the knee. Okay. 
And so then the treatment was very different than arthritis. The treatment was actually surgery where they removed the lining and they put it back, which is all to say that even in the physical <laughs> realm, diagnoses are tricky. Yeah, sure. But some, so something was going on with my knee. Uh-huh. There was a symptom. And there was this kind of five-year period where there was trying to get the right explanation of what was happening to mm-hmm. my knee so they could give me the right treatment. Yeah. So as you were saying, initially, it was an incorrect identification. And mm-hmm. what they were doing was not actually addressing. It was problem. not addressing at all. And hopefully it didn't cause other problems. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but at the very least, it left my knee untreated uh-huh. for five years. Yeah. And if it had been left untreated for my lifetime, eventually it would have stiffened my knee and I would have lost movement uh-huh. okay. in my knee. Okay. So it's as though the initial diagnosis was kind of enough for the time being. Okay, they think they know what this is. We're going to act on that assumption and see if it improves. And mm-hmm. that's a lot of time that passed to to decide, okay, no, this isn't actually doing this isn't actually isn't actually that. So one of the problems with diagnosis is is getting it wrong yeah. or thinking you have the right one too early in the process. Sure, because if these are very complicated biological and psychological explanations of what is happening to a person. Yeah, and if it's wrong, it can cause have serious consequences. Yeah, yeah, you may get totally lucky, and maybe it's the same treatment for both problems but that's kind of rare and you were diagnosed in the mental health arena yeah right i mean a few times throughout my life i was diagnosed with the same exact diagnosis of severe depression um and my experience with that was okay it's like i didn't feel as though i necessarily needed that diagnosis i could tell you that i was depressed right (laughs) anyone can tell anyone that really you know and really all that that was for was that they, so they could prescribe me drugs mm-hmm. to because the idea was oh we have these drugs that we think does something for depression and so it's like you have this condition we can't say why we have no idea what caused it we don't know if it's some kind of chemical thing in you we don't know if it's completely environmental or if it's they have no idea it's just like okay they asked me some questions you're sad <laughs> you're suicidal whatever it is mm-hmm. We think these drugs will help you. There you go. And then from there... And did they help you? Um, well, what they did was they didn't help the depression, really. I mean, what they did was they kind of quieted my brain a little bit. I had mm-hmm. really noisy thoughts, which is kind of obsessive, nonstop, like replaying the day, replaying conversations, things like that. It kind of quieted that a little bit to where I found that it was a little... I was a little more at peace, I guess sort of overall and then i got better sleep because it was really hard for me to sleep i'd go i'd lay down and just like images and ideas just racing around in my head and it would be really hard for me to fall asleep sometimes i couldn't at all Mm -hmm. Um, so it quieted that enough that i got better sleep and, and things like that so there was a positive there for that but that alone so it may that may indirectly help with the idea of depression i think so maybe in some cases okay great that's Mm -hmm. there you go they didn't solve the depression. They didn't actually solve the... But I also have an issue with just the idea of depression in general, too. Well, so one thing that happens when you get a diagnosis... Again, a diagnosis is an explanation of, of what is going on. Yeah. And when it's given a label, yeah. l- like depression, mm-hmm. one thing that is brought with that label and diagnosis is a theory of, of that disease yeah. and condition. Right. So going back to my knee for a minute... Again, the name of the condition, pigmented villanogenal synovitis, it's just a description, mm-hmm. color bumps on the knee. It was so rare, they don't really even have a theory of the disease. They didn't know okay. what caused it, where it came from, yeah. it tied to genetics, environmental. Um, they did know that if you remove the lining of the knee, it would grow back. And in most cases, it grew back without disease. So okay. that was it. Yeah. If it grew back with the disease, they, there was no second treatment I mean, so because they again didn't, they didn't under, they didn't have a theory of that disease yeah with with depression there have been a lot of theories of the disease right as you say one you of could, them you, just being that it's the disease to begin with yep yeah, right so you could have told the the psychiatrist whoever was was treating you that mm-hmm. you were depressed as you said yeah <laughs> you didn't need someone to tell you, you were depressed right what they were telling you is that you had this certain type of condition or yeah. disorder or 
disease called depression. And then there's, again, there's theories surrounding what that means. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the medication, which I assume were SSRIs. Yes. Which is kind of, at this point, the go-to medication for depression. And it is because one of the theories of the disease of depression is it's a chemical imbalance and you have low serotonin in your brain. Right. You've, you've heard that. Yeah. Was that how it was described with you? Yeah. Why you were taking that medication? Yeah. So interestingly, there was just a recent meta-analysis of studies of SSRIs and serotonin, meaning it, it was a, a study that looked at, I think it was like 17 other studies mm -hmm. of the connection between depression and serotonin levels. And what that, what they discovered is there, there seems to be no connection uh -huh, between right. low serotonin <laughs> and depression. Right. So that theory of that disease has in some ways been invalidated. Yeah, right. So the purpose, the original purpose of using these drugs for depression is now moot, kind of. It is, although it doesn't necessarily mean they don't work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but right. they don't work because they increase the level of serotonin in your brain and low serotonin is what is causing the depression. So that, yeah. the that theory has not been proven at this point. Right. In fact, there's evidence that that is not true. So it's kind of similar to your knee case where they didn't, they didn't necessarily know what caused this mm -hmm. and, and how to treat it, except mm -hmm. that we've done this before and it worked. It worked with some people. And it, yeah. as, as you probably know, the record for SSRI is not great. Mm -hmm. It's better than any other pharmaceutical treatment yeah. for depression, but there's a lot of people that they don't, it doesn't work for. Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me because my, my, now, now if I explode out my experience with this drug was that that's pretty much all it did. And then I coasted along and I was still depressed. So it's like, okay, well, why am I taking this exactly? There were some side effects, which I didn't really appreciate. Mm -hmm. And eventually I stopped later. It got really bad again, started taking it again. Same, same experience. Actually, the second time around, I didn't even really have the quieted brain so much either. So it was like, really didn't seem like it was doing anything at all. And this goes back to the, a problem with being diagnosed, either misdiagnosed like I was, or diagnosed under a theory of a disease that is false, right. is that it prevents you from getting the treatment and the help that you need. Yeah. I mean, it, it gave me this kind of false sense of resolve, I think. In, in, in when, when I first started taking it, it's like, okay, this is, they're telling me this is something I need to do. I'm, I'm doing it. Great. I'm, I'm doing something for my depression. But mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the case that I was doing anything for depression. The therapy could have helped and but like we've talked about i didn't give that much enough of a chance or i didn't have enough information or the correct information to give the therapist really so i was just kind of at a dead end on the whole thing now i have a bigger picture understanding of what the depression was and in my case i don't think it had anything to do with any sort of disease or chemical imbalance i think it was a result of all these other things we talked about in the first two seasons of of this podcast just this patterns of thinking and this powerlessness and, and all those things. And so we've talked about, for you, depression was really a symptom yes. rather than a disease. Yeah, exactly. Right. A and this can be problematic as well and, and goes into kind of what the theoretical part of diagnosis and the theoretical part of diseases yeah. is there are symptoms mm -hmm. and then there are diseases. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and conditions. Right. And those things have causal connections mm -hmm. but symptoms we see as a result of cause not as originator one example being a fever yeah sure so it may be historically way back when they didn't know very much a fever was treated like a, a disease or a condition itself right. mm -hmm. like you just needed to stop someone from having a fever yeah but now that we know more about why people get fevers the important thing is to figure out what is causing the fever. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not enough just to treat the fever. In fact, mm -hmm. it can be counterproductive to treat the fever if you yeah. don't understand what the underlying disease is. Especially if you stop there. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm doing what we think we are supposed to do to treat a fever. And a fever has a function. The body developed a fever for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it might be doing good for the body to have the fever. Yeah. 
True. Like, for instance, a cough. A cough is a symptom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or a runny nose or something like that. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. not a disease. And, you know, cough suppressants are often not recommended by doctors and physicians because you're coughing in order to loosen mucus and move it up the, the, the chain. So if you suppress that symptom, sure, right. you are going to exacerbate the underlying disease or condition. Yeah. Yeah, or like pain relief or something like that like if you just take pain relief every single day because you have pain like well why do you have pain <laughs> if you don't know and you're just taking pain relief every day to get rid of the pain then you're you, getting rid of the signal you're getting rid of the signal and not the underlying condition and, and yeah. you know it, it it can be very difficult to figure out what is happening yeah it's not to say that if drugs help to make you feel better while you figure out what is happening yes exactly right <laughs> yep which might have happened with you if you had a better therapeutic partner, for instance. Yeah. If you had someone who just didn't say, well, you're depressed, here's some <laughs> medication, right. let me know if it makes you feel better. Right. If you had someone that partnered that with, okay, you're, you're depressed, here's some medication that may, you, might you, make you feel better a little bit, like decrease your mental pain, essentially. Yeah. Treat it as kind of pain relief for right. a mental condition. Now and, let's figure out what's going on. Now let's is. figure out what's actually going on. Yeah, exactly. Right. One other thought I had on this depression being more of a symptom mm -hmm. in my case mm -hmm. um, is that even though de de depression itself seemed to be kind of a collect a collection of symptoms, the depression itself did it itself have some symptoms also. The depression would cause things like tiredness and lack of motivation and things like that, which you know, those things could have also just indirectly be, been coming from the big picture of mm -hmm. powerlessness and things like that. But it can also be coming from the depression, the, but the depression is coming from, so it's like A leads to B leads to C sort of thing. It can be, it's hard, of, it can be hard to, to root out the actual cause yeah, or the set of causes right. to all of those things. Yeah. So you were tired, you were depressed, you were isolated, you were unmotivated, Yeah. you felt physically worn out. Right, those could have all been connected to a similar set of causes, or it, they could have come from each other and, yeah. and reinforcing each other. What you discovered about yourself in terms of telling the story of what was happening with you, the depression came from where? Well, it wound up being just this kind of signal that I had unresolved trauma, that I felt powerless in my entire life, that I didn't have good connections with anyone, mm -hmm. that I felt alone. And the second major depressive episode came when you were in an abusive relationship. Yeah. So there was that layered on it as well. Right. Also signaling me that this is something's wrong here in your overall situation. And you've told me one story, which I think is really, which I think really illustrates how problematic the diagnosis of depression can be when it was pretty far into your relationship with R. And you were severely depressed. Yeah. Because of the daily abuse. Yeah. And had started to use alcohol. Yeah. As a strategy for dealing with that. Yeah. Yeah. There was one particular time where I was just severely depressed. I was actually sober at the time, trying, you know, trying to this whole, trying the AA thing again, like I had years before, because I was starting to act out with alcohol, or at least it felt good. It, it was this temporary relief. And also I think it was this subconscious acting out, trying to sabotage the relationship. But um, yeah, there was one time where uh, R left the house and I just kind of really quickly just got hammered and passed out on the bed and she came home and this sent us into this conversation about how I confided in her that I was feeling suicidal again. And um, so that we wound up going to this kind of 24 hour emergency psychiatric place and uh, sat there for about six hours waiting to be admitted into a room to, to have a two minute conversation with this guy that was asking me these very cold questions and not making eye contact and then going, okay, what we're going to do is double your prescription of the antidepressants that I was already taking. Mm -hmm. um, and that sent me on my way. And then it was kind of like, the thing I've noticed with antidepressants myself in the past was I would get kind of almost instant relief. Like I would, I would take the new pill with the new dosage or just for the first time taking a pill mm -hmm. and go, ah, 
like, wow, the next day I, I'm like, I feel like my depression's gone or something. Right. But obviously it doesn't work that way. It takes a while. Depression is a condition that's highly sensitive to the placebo effect. Yes, right. Mm-hmm. But just to go back to what you said that he sent you on his on your way, yeah. he didn't just send you on his your way. He yeah. sent you back to a situation and a, a home in which you experienced daily violence. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you didn't mention that when you fell off the wagon, so to speak, and mm-hmm. she left and got drunk, it was on the heels of this pretty abusive situation where she and her friends were belittling you and yeah. humiliating you, insulting you to your face. Right. Yeah. She had some friends that were in town visiting and uh, yeah, they were getting drunk in front of me and, and they had asked me to bring them to this bar. They wanted me to be a designated driver for them that evening. So I went and dropped them off and went home and waited for them to call me again and go back. And then they were kind of, by then they were really drunk, all of them. And uh, R was making fun of me in front of them. And I was sitting there for, I thought it was time to pick them up. Instead, I was sitting there for maybe 30, another 30, 45 minutes while it was this kind of direct assault. Mm-hmm. which she didn't normally do, but I think, you know... Because they were all drunk. Yeah, they were all drunk. And it often happened that R kind of let her guard down as far as, like, not being as insult. You know, she would get, would get a lot more insulting when... Sure. Just kind of inhibitions gone or whatever. Yeah, so that was, you know, the that was the direct cause of... <laughs> she leaves, and you're like, okay. Yeah. Whatever, I'm just drinking myself to oblivion here because right, that, this the, is so terrible. And then yeah. you go in, and what you get is you get, oh, yes, you're depressed and you need more serotonin right, or something. Right. <laughs> off you go back to your yeah right back home abusive again situation and, yeah this is connected too to the idea of alcoholism as a disease right yeah and the theory of the disease there is that the problem is out al- your relationship to alcohol yeah and again you know psychological and biological problems with alcohol mm-hmm. and you were essentially diagnosed as an alcoholic yeah, as yeah, well and diagnosed right. yourself with that as if the problem, what was going on, is that you just couldn't drink responsibly. Yeah, it's responsibly. kind of an interesting... The whole idea of, of that, al- alcoholism and how to treat it is kind of an interesting topic. But Because things like AA, they try to help you help yourself in other ways, you know, mm-hmm. figure out some root causes of various things. But still, at the very core of it, it's like you have to hold on to this idea that really kind of ultimately the whole reason why you're here is because you can't control your alcohol intake right you have no power over alcohol yeah but for you similar to depression it seemed like the alcohol abuse and the alcoholism was a symptom yeah another the depression symptom. was a symptom yeah the situation was unhealed trauma not yeah. just unhealed trauma but ongoing trauma right. in your personal and domestic life yeah constantly getting triggered and adding to yeah so the real problem being something that was not even really being talked about. Mm-hmm. You know, if I did talk to anyone about it, it was very diluted and coming fr- from this kind of distorted, warped position. But these explanations, these diagnoses, things like depression, and even somewhat like alcoholism at this point, are given this privileged position yeah. within the health community and within larger society. Mm-hmm. So that if you have if you have a diagnosis that's official, if it's in the book, right? right. <laughs> Yeah. Then that counts. Yeah. That's a more factual or true explanation than an explanation that doesn't end up in the yeah. official manual. It's because everybody wants kind of a more easy explanation. It, it, if going back to the disease model being like, there are several things like diabetes that are easy to identify. And then there's treatments that we mm-hmm. know work. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, A, identify the problem. B, do a treatment that we know works there done and everybody wants everything to be that way right like just not complex at all but depression is extremely complex alcoholism. and it's gonna be different for almost everybody alcoholism you know? yeah extre- extremely compl- complex yeah. so, so we, we i remember i know we've talked about this before but i i know we, do you have an example of um when diagnosis can be a problem on the other side of the coin where people don't take it seriously unless you have a diagnosis, like don't take an idea seriously unless you have a diagnosis. Well, we, right. So we've talked about narcissism. Right. And we've described your two exes as narcissistic. Mm. We don't have an official <laughs> diagnosis of yeah, that. Right. So, so you, you'll see online, I'm sure you've seen this. Some people complain about 
using that term narcissism to apply to people because it's an official diagnosis and only people yeah, right. who have credentials <laughs> <laughs> right mental health credentials are allowed to use that word mm -hmm. but if it's a helpful explanation of someone's behavior if it's a helpful explanation of what was going on why can't we use it yeah i mean we're not trying to prescribe medication <laughs> right exactly I, and because really you know, unfortunately, a lot of diagnosis now and what goes in the manual and what's official is tied to the medical industry and the mental health industry. In, in insurance industry, too, right? Yeah. Medical so, insurance, yeah. Yeah, you have, to, you have to give people a diagnosis in order to be able to in order to be able to get money for treating them, in order to get authorization yeah. for treating them, in order to prescribe drugs. So it get very much wrapped up in, and controlled by this industrial model of yeah. talking about mental health and talking about health in general right so it starts to lose its value yeah i mean it, it's already as we're saying kind of a shot in the dark and trying to to have a one-size-fits-all explanation of something that could be very complex and and being caused or as we said a symptom as opposed to an actual problem <laughs> itself um but then yeah you add in these things like the motivations for diagnosis and then, then there's another layer of problems so when we identify them as narcissists and talk about that phenomenon of narcissism, which, which first of all, it's been around forever, right? Yeah, I mean, right. Long before like this Greek, right. Greek myth, right? So it's not as if the medical community discovered this phenomenon of narcissism. People have talked about it for a long time. But we use it because it, it's a helpful description of their behavior. Yeah. We're not putting it into a medical context. We're not interested in diagnosing Well, these, and actually, these the diagnosis is narcissistic personality disorder. We mm -hmm. You know, and, you know there's you not really use that term. No, we're not using that term, and there's not really very many treatments for it. Right. <laughs> so I'm not sure what the benefit even in moving it into right. kind of the more formal mental health realm. Yeah. So similar with codependency, it, yep. it doesn't matter that it's not an official diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's a, a collection of behaviors. It's you that it's useful to think of. Under this umbrella term, uh, people who engage in those behaviors have a lot of similar experiences mm -hmm. and similar reasons, often, how they got to the point where they feel that they are codependent. So it can be really helpful to see other people's thoughts on this collection of behaviors and, and other people's research and, and experience with other people that had similar behaviors and how they helped them and how these people maybe got over these behaviors mm -hmm. and through these behaviors. Yep. And how they how they healed themselves or, yeah. or, or found partners, whether they be formal mental health professional partners or like you and I, yeah. um, friends or family that helped them resolve the codependency. So mm -hmm. to help them figure out what was going on, why they behaved the way that they did, yeah, how those behaviors were hurting or helping them. And if they were hurting them, how to resolve those behaviors, treat and treat whatever the underlying conditions were that were causing them to behave that way. Yeah, because I kind of have this this very clear memory of before we came up with some of these explanations, especially the codependency one, it seemed really daunting. It seemed like I had all these these bizarre behaviors that like they must be related somehow, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to organize it. And mm -hmm. do I try to address one behavior at a time? Like that didn't doesn't really seem to work. Mm -hmm. So once we have this grouping, it's like, oh, okay, here's some strategies on how to deal with this kind of bigger picture explanation. Of mm -hmm. these behaviors. And I remember talking about too that certain behaviors just kind of fall away when you address the bigger picture. So we're more, you know more akin maybe to auto mechanics. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Again, other other things can be di diagnosed if if it, what you're looking for is a theory of or a an explanation for symptoms and and results. Yeah. So I think the main takeaways for us in terms of our engagement with this idea of diagnosis mm -hmm. is being very careful about determining what is a symptom and what is the actual disease or condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And making sure that you can treat the symptoms if it helps you feel better in the short term. Yeah. But the, the longer term is to treat the actual cause right. of those symptoms. And that may be a formal disease <laughs> sure. that can be diagnosed and mm -hmm. medicated for or built to, or it, it may be a collection of experiences that you had and habits that you developed out of those experiences. Yeah, and then the treatment being just actually just acknowledging that and understanding it and mm -hmm. working th through it in ways that don't involve some kind of physical intervention or medication or something like that. 
because we even have described codependency as really the symptom or collection of symptoms. Yes, exactly. And right. that because the cause being this kind of trauma mm -hmm. in your childhood, which then created behaviors and habits, psychological and otherwise, that prevented you from healing from that trauma and then caused more trauma in other interpersonal relationships. Right. So if you have any of your own thoughts and ideas about this subject that we just talked about, diagnoses, uh, we'd love to hear from you. We can You can find us on uh, Facebook or Instagram by searching A Codependent Mind. And as always, we would appreciate a like or review on the podcast platform of your choice. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another topic. We hope you join us.